Welcome to TechCrunch Now. I'm Evelyn Risley. This is the show where we debate the top headlines on TechCrunch and beyond with our in-house guests as well as experts from beyond TechCrunch. And today on episode one, we're joined by Jason Kincaid and M.G. Sigler, who are writers, of course, on TechCrunch, but more importantly, the hosts of a new show, OMG JK. Now, before we get into the headlines, guys, tell us about your new show and what it is besides being an awesome title. Well, I mean, to be perfectly honest, it's, it's going to be totally unscripted. I think we're just going to go in and talk about the, the hot topics uh, in technology for the week. Uh, and we'll probably throw a few insults at each other. But. Right. We, we come at things from a pretty different perspective. You know, it all yeah, kind of boils Android. down to, right, <laughs> kind of iPhone versus Android. So mm -hmm. I think that we have a lot of different uh, conflicting perspectives. But a lot of topics Android. beyond that, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Now, that's at the heart of our conflict. Now, speaking of the heart of your conflict, one of the top headlines today is surprise, surprise, the iPhone 4. And despite all the drama and all the complaints, Apple still had a great sales run. I mean, selling over 1.7 million phones in the first three days. Steve Jobs even said this is the most successful product launch in Apple's history. Now, what do you think, Jason? How important is the iPhone 4 to Apple's timeline and lineup in general? Well, I think it's pretty clearly its flagship product. You talk to someone about Apple, and the first thing they're going to think about is the iPhone as opposed to the Mac or even the iPod, which really was its leading product for, for the last, I don't know, five or six years. Um, so it's, it's obviously really important and I think it's off to a great start. Um, but you don't plan on buying one anytime soon? <laughs> not, not anytime soon unless they change their policies with regard to the App Store. Uh, but for the time being, Android suits me just fine. I've got a Nexus One and I love it. And MG, you're from a completely different perspective. You've been right. playing with the iPhone since its launch and as far as I can tell, you love it, right? What are some of the pros and cons, your final assessment on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly Jason even remarked on how, how nice a video it takes. The HD video is pretty solid of it. The camera itself is pretty solid. The whole hardware is very solid, except for maybe that antenna issue, which, you know, <laughs> we're still waiting for a resolution on it. If it's a software fact, yeah. fix or whatever it'll be. but. Uh, yeah, overall, it's just a really solid phone. It's super fast. Now, amusingly, Steve Jobs has apologized to users who had a hard time getting the phone, but he hasn't apologized to people who've had these hardware issues. I mean, the antenna thing is, is pretty fundamental. I, I feel like he should have apologized. Um, right now, the iPhone 4 is doing well, but a lot of iterations of the Android are now coming up. Do you think that he can be so cavalier, MG? Well, you know, we'll see again what ends what ends up happening for fixing this uh, this issue with the antenna. You know, it's still it's still early to tell if there's actually that much of an issue. Obviously, you can see it like in certain devices at certain times. It doesn't seem to be always, but like if you cup it in one hand, you can actually see the the degradation of the signal. But it's not clear if that's actually degrading the signal or not. Like when you're making a call, the sad part is that none of people can make calls all the time on AT and T. Yeah. That it's hard to tell if it's you know actually broken or not. Has it affected your ability? I mean, can you? Kind of piece that out? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I've been using it since last Thursday and I haven't noticed anything major, you know, beyond the regular AT&T hiccups, but I was up in Tahoe <laughs> the past weekend where AT&T was working a lot better and yeah, I didn't notice anything major. Yeah. And anyways, elsewhere today, a key hire uh, in Facebook, actually, the Google's director of engineering, Matthew Papakipos, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is out and leaving for Facebook. On Twitter, he said, now that Chrome OS and WebGL are in good shape, it's time for something new. I'm going to work at Facebook. Love the product and team. Woot! Exclamation mark. So what does this departure of a key architect mean for Google and Facebook? Well, I think it's obviously a really big win for Facebook. Uh, and it's a little bizarre, frankly, <laughs> given that he's leaving a few months before Chrome yeah. is expecting to make its debut. Do you buy uh, what he says when he's saying, oh, well, it's in good shape, now I can leave? I'd be surprised if there weren't frustrations that contributed to this. Mm -hmm. um, and my guess would be it, may be it may have something to do with the way Android and Chrome OS are sort of playing out in Google's strategy, the fact that they've got two basically competing operating systems. And at some point, they're probably going to merge into one but, I mean, this is entirely speculation on my part, but I, I really don't think that he would have picked this time to leave if something else hadn't contributed to it. Unless he's getting a ton of money from Facebook, of yes. course, which is also a possibility. <laughs> and, you know, of course, Facebook can offer, you know, stock options yeah. that Google really can at this point. Since Does it have any implications private. for the launch of OS later? Um, I mean, yeah, we talked to Google a little bit today. They said it's still on track for the fall, and you know, they they remarked about their the strength of their bench. So you know, I guess they feel this guy is a little yeah. I mean, what else are they going to say? Right. <laughs> now, also related in terms of Google, Facebook, and all that, their rivalry might be heating up. There was some word on the street that there could be a Google Me that could be a direct competitor to Facebook. What do you think about that? What do you think about that speculation? 
Well, I think that, that was based, I think, entirely off of a, a tweet by Kevin Rose. Yeah. Uh, How credible is Kevin Rose? <laughs> he's been right before. He's been wrong before. Yeah. Uh, I think we should probably do a little more research as far as you know his batting average. But <laughs> I'm skeptical for anything really social from Google, just mm -hmm. because it's. I can't remember the last time they really had a grand slam with anything social. Right. You know, They've buzz. kind of buzz, wave, both those have just been, you know, kind of eh, eh to eh. Yeah. And so it's, uh, <laughs> we'll see if they're able to do something with me. You know, there's rumors that it might be based around what they've been doing with profiles mm -hmm. and things like that. And they've been trying to hire a new director of social for the, the entire overall picture of what, what they're trying to do. What is fundamentally wrong with their social strategy? I mean, we recently talked to Dennis Crowley, you know, who in the past has said that they've had a hopeless social strategy, you know, obviously with the failure of dodgeball and all that. Right. Why can't they get it right? They have all the resources in the world. I think the user experience is generally pretty poor when it mm -hmm. comes to the way Google hand it, or manages like its accounts and your connections to other users. I mean, just browsing through your Google profile right now, it's very bare bones and not very intuitive. And I think that's something they, they just haven't done a good job making it feel like I have a Google presence. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, it's kind of like trying to paint a brick wall or something. There's all these little cracks and stuff that you can't quite get yeah. unless you really get in there. And they started out, you know, obviously with Gmail as one of their, their big products with over 100 million users. And they're kind of just trying to lay this on top of that. You know, they've done that numerous times and kind of stumbled along the way. And they even tried to rework profiles so you could have a vanity URL, but the vanity URL was using what your Gmail name is. And that's just kind of ridiculous, you know, because then everyone will know your Gmail name. Yeah, but never count them out because they do have tons of money and they can just throw sure. that at the problem. Also, Jason, this morning you wrote a post on JibJab and they passed the one million mark when it came to paid process transactions. And we talked to their co-founder and this is what he had to say. Uh, it's a huge milestone for the company. For the first six months of this year, we're doing over 2x the business that we did last year. Um, which is fantastic because uh, January through June is typically a slower period. I mean, outside of Valentine's Day, not a, like a high season for e-cards mm -hmm. sending, which is uh, the fourth quarter of the year. So we're, we're, we're revving up and uh, we're really excited. We're, we're about to create a very meaningful, very profitable business. So what do you think, Jason? How significant is this one million mark? Do they have a sustainably profitable business here? It's a little hard to tell yeah. because he wouldn't really break out what the transactions were coming from. I mean, all he said it, they were paid transactions, right? Right, and mm -hmm. some of those transactions are from recurring subscriptions, which are obviously good news for them. They get twelve dollars a year per user who signs up for that. But some of them are sort of one-off downloads, digital downloads, and some of them, if I buy a mug with my face on it, you know, <laughs> that's not really a recurring uh, fee. So it's hard to tell. I think it's good news for them, uh, and he said that it's doubling since last year as far as how many transactions they have. So it's definitely in the right direction, but it's kind of hard to gauge you know, just how significant this is without more details. Yeah. My, my question for them really was how do you create a real sustainable profitable model throughout the year? Because they are very profitable during the holiday shopping season mm -hmm. and then everything else. You know, It's very contingent on whether or not their campaigns go viral and it's usually just a handful here and there. Mm -hmm. What do you think, MJ? Do you like JibJab? Do you think that they can do it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great product. I do think that they need to, you know, they're almost kind of contingent on certain things like political things obviously but they need to do a better job of maybe getting in and all these different memes out there and all the different pop culture stuff and really kind of nailing that home and getting it to go viral more often. Oh. I, I will say they had a Star Wars like customized with your face that came out a month or two ago which was awesome. Better than Elf Yourself. It was the coolest thing I've seen. Gotcha. Okay so Jason is bullish on that. Well that's all for now. Thanks a lot Jason and MG. Make sure to tune in to OMG JK later this week. Until next time that's TechCrunch Now.